Question one. Should a national scale school reopening be considered at all? Answer, emphatically no. Uh, that is the opening salvo from Lori Garrett, Pulitzer Prize winning science journalist who has been both scary and right about coronavirus from the very beginning. Uh, she's just written this new very sobering piece, which is called America's Schools Are a Moral and Medical Catastrophe, a guide to understanding the science and the politics preventing U.S. children from being educated this year. Preventing U.S. children from being educated this year, this whole year? Lori Garrett calling the White House demand for schools to reopen and to figure out how on their own, quote, nothing short of moral bankruptcy. Uh, joining us now, without further ado, is Lori Garrett, as I mentioned, Pulitzer Prize winning science journalist and somebody who we've check been checking back in with periodically over the course of this crisis, um, if for no other reason than she keeps us honest. Lori, thank you so much for being here today. This is a bracing read. Thank you, Rachel. You have been willing to say stark things, um, including in terms that other people would be likely to sugarcoat, and you lay it out bluntly. What do you think is the reality check that Americans need about safety considerations and the realistic chances of opening in-person in instruction for kids this year? Well, there's several things. First of all, it, it's not zero risk, even in communities where the transmission of COVID-19 is relatively low. Uh, opening schools is not a zero risk exercise. Uh, you don't know what the scale of the risk is unless you've done your baseline testing. You know exactly what percentage of your kids in each school level, each age group are already infected what percentage of your teachers, your cafeteria workers, your janitorial staff, and, and your uh, administrators are infected, and you track them over time in cohorts so that you follow infection rates, and you have baseline data and building data, and then you have people, you have policies in place for what to do if someone is infected, and you have people who can track them and figure out if they took virus home to their grandmother, to their father to whomever none of this is being done in almost any school district in america and on top of that the costs how do you make a school safe to attend for everybody involved the adults the children the visiting parents how do you make a school safe to attend it costs money you have to have a good air conditioning and airflow system. You have to limit the number of people per classroom, which means more space needs to be somehow available or staggered schedules with more teachers handling fewer students. All of these things need to be done and they can't be done in school districts where there has never been enough money to do basic education at any time in the last many decades. So we're asking schools that have zero spare cash to somehow build a fancy air filtration system, to somehow do testing and somehow create additional classrooms. They don't have money. Lori, I am struck that the very first thing that you said was testing, that schools need access to frequent quick turnaround, repeated testing for kids, for school staff, for teachers. Um, and it needs to be linked into a competent contact tracing, essentially outbreak monitoring system. Um, I feel like even six months into this, in terms of the, the, the massive death that we have seen in the United States, we still don't have testing figured out even for nursing homes, even for long-term care facilities, where we have had this huge bulk of the American deaths come from. I, even in well-resourced school districts, it seems to me very unlikely that they're gonna have access just to that first thing that you described, the, that kind of testing regime. Rachel, universities in the Ivy League won't have it. So how would a public school located in a desperately poor community or on a Native American reservation land or in rural Alabama possibly have it? I mean, this is just so poorly thought out. It's the, the rewrite on the CDC document is shameful. It's a, it, it is a mandate that doesn't even begin to discuss safety for the employees 
it's all written from the point of view of, of dismissing the possibility that children will somehow get sick and die, and, and therefore the school should open without any real precautions taken. It's, it's absolutely immoral. You know, Betsy DeVos gave an interview, in which, and she's the Secretary of Education, in which she basically said, how you open is up to you, folks. You decide. We're just telling you, you have to open, or we're taking your money away from you. Now, they don't even have enough money to teach the kids under normal circumstances in many school districts across America, and you're telling them, conjure resources somehow to do something unheard of. The, the real problem, Rachel, is that testing anywhere is being, for any cohort, is being done stupidly. It's utterly irrational what we're doing in this country right now. We're asking people to queue up in a parking lot um, and let their car engine run for eight hours to get a test that they get the results from three to seven to ten days later. What we're not doing is smart testing that targets specific cohorts of people as sort of canaries in the coal mine to let us see over time, uh-oh, we see a little uptick in the first grade class, Miss McGrath, her class. We got to get in there real quick, do some contact tracing and find out what's going on in Miss McGrath's class. We don't have the capacity. Nobody's setting that up. So we're, we're just going to throw children to the wolves, throw teachers to the wolves all for some mythological reason that somehow there's this massive demand. But in fact, every survey and poll I've seen for the last seven, 10 days shows the majority of parents don't want to send their kids to school if they are unsure about its safety. And they are unsure about its safety, especially in these states with rampant, out of control, community spread of uh, SARS-CoV-2. It's it's irrational. Lori Garrett, science writer, former senior fellow for Global Health Council on Foreign Relations, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Lori, thank you for speaking that blunt truth here tonight. Thank you for always doing that. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Rachel.